Kell is the legendary cartoonist for The Economist, uh, been doing that for a little while, uh, and for The Baltimore Sun. Uh, I can't even remember when, when, when I first met Kell, given that the two of us have been in the business for a while, something like a collective or 80 years or something. Uh, and I so admire his, his, his attention to detail. Uh, Wes, look at, look at that. all of the characters there on the book cover, right? But what you don't realize is that if you look a little closer, god damn, he's drawn them again on the drawing board. <laughs> anyway, um, here are, this is one of my favorite Cal cartoons. It's just a wonderful, it's almost a, you know, what foreign enemies think Americans are looking for. It's almost a cartoon on a political cartoon, world control, right? Uh, what Americans are really looking for is the remote control. <laughs> I, I was with uh, uh, Cal last, uh, to, to, just to illustrate how, how universally popular he is with his confrères. I was with uh, Cal last September in San Francisco, and David Rowe is known, uh, an Australian caricature, known for doing savage caricatures of people. He drew Cal and he was nice. You're going to do this nice caricature of him. So, um, Cal has a surprisingly optimistic point of view, given you know, the angst that exists within, uh, within the cartooning world. So I'm going to ask my pal Cal to get out here. Come on. Hey. <laughs> Good, Good to see you, Terry. Good to see you. Me. Oh, so that was impressive. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So it's great to be here, it's so great. And I tell you what, it is so cool to hang out with cartoonists. So much fun to be here. But one of the things actually what happens uh, with cartoonists, one of the things we all do, we all are looking constantly at each other's work, mountains of work, you're constantly scouring everybody's work and inevitably what happens is we see a cartoon and often from one of Terry's you look at it and you go, oh, I wish I'd come up with that idea. And recently that happened to me, I, I saw a cartoon uh, done in the New Yorker by a cartoonist named Liam Walsh. And it takes place in a Manhattan bar, okay? And there's a guy there drinking hand, and he's wearing one of these plastic dog collars, you know, the things that they put on animals to stop them from licking their nether regions, you know, the one I'm talking about. And he's sitting op opposite him, he's addressing his friend, and he's saying, it keeps me from looking at my phone every two minutes, <laughs> okay? So I feel, I feel this, my challenge today is to keep you guys from looking at your phone every two minutes, okay? And if I can do it maybe once a minute, you know, then I think I'm doing pretty good. But I think it's actually going to be pretty easy because I'm going to be talking to you today about cartoons and about some of what I think is the, the positive, what are the great things that cartoons have to offer and where I think we're going to be going. So um, one of the first things I want to talk about, uh, I was given the, the task of talking about something that's entertaining, and enraging at the same time. And of the many facets of cartoons, the one element that crystallizes that is caricature. Now, when I talk about caricature, I'm not gonna talk today about those people you might see down at the tourist um, uh, centers or, or at birthday parties that are knocking things, things out real quick. No, I'm talking about a, uh, a, a, an image that could puncture the pomposity of the powerful with a portrait that is part poison, and that's what a good caricature is, okay? So, best way for me to move forward is to maybe go back to the, some of the early history of this, because I think this is really important place to start. Actually, I meant my early history of this, okay? So, here's a cartoon I did when I was six years old. It's a caricature, Abraham Lincoln. Okay, you can see their Gettysburg Address and that sort of thing. Now, this is, by the way, a very important cartoon, seminal cartoon, because this cartoon inspired a feature-length motion picture starring Daniel Day-Lewis. Okay? <laughs> this cartoon did it, okay? But here's the thing. At age six, everybody in this room was drawing. Okay? Everybody was drawing. Everyone is trying to capture the world in lines. Look at the sun. That is the way that we perceive as a sun as a child and maybe often see today. We know we look at the sun, it's got no lines, but we try to cast lines on things that get some greater understanding. 
Now the difference though for people like myself and these clowns up here is that we carried on being a six-year-old, a professional six-year-old, while many of you guys moved on to, to other things. So one of the things about being a cartoonist and a caricaturist is actually there's no schools for our craft. So when I started after university wanting to learn how to do caricature, I had to take to the streets and start drawing all sorts of tourists, hundreds, maybe even thousands of tourists who come and stand in front of you and pay you some money and you would have a go at drawing their face. But the problem was, I was a terrible businessman because the real good guys can knock these things out in five minutes and then pass it on and get a line of people coming through. I would take a half an hour 45 minutes because I was trying to get to something more substantial about the individual. And it wasn't until I read a quote from the great um, Renaissance Italian painter Annabel Caracci who said a good caricature is more true to life than reality itself that I realized that's what I was trying to do. And many of us, the good ones in the profession, that's what we try to do in our business. So I got my first job actually working for The Economist, if you can imagine, at age 22, just on a university. And now I wasn't drawing holiday makers, I was drawing policy makers. And you find that when you draw these people, it's a different kind of thing. So we have, of course, Ronald Reagan and the guy on the left, the old guy, we haven't seen him for a while, uh, Gorbachev, okay? And then we also, I've been drawing possibly every major world leader in the past 37 years, whether they're from South, uh, North, uh, North Korea. Um, but of course, American presidents have supplied a lot of the material because American presidents, you know, um, are really almost kind of like the president of the free world. People, everyone watches them very closely. And the subject matter is also very interesting that a good caricature also can tell a story about who the people are and what sort of things they're doing. <laughs> now, some of these politicians um, uh, supplied more uh, stories than others, George, uh, George Bush in particular. But now, of course, we have election coming up. So now there's a whole new crack cast of people <laughs> coming along. <laughs> OK, giving us some possible uh, material. Now, when Dick Cheney had a hunting accident, <laughs> It was a tragic incident, but it also supplied some good material for us cartoonists. Now, one of the things about caricature, particularly with, of, of politicians, you realize that when they're in office, they, their faces age exponentially for some reason when they're in, in, in office. Remember now, 2008, this is what Barack Obama looked like when he took office, right? He was, he was, he was um, taut skin and he was optimistic and he had bright white teeth and always looking upwards. Let's fast forward five years, eight years, what does he look like? He looks like this, okay? The lines are pulling down, it's the weight, I, I say it's the, the weight uh, of, of the job pulling in all directions. And it's not just US presidents, in the prime minister in, in UK, David Cameron, when he first came to office, he had a very baby face, but yet within months, he was actually in, introducing a lot of austerity measures in, 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 uh, in Britain. And, and you've seen how quickly his face changed. It wasn't long he looked like this. OK? <laughs> Amazing what it will do. So, so now, we've been having some fun and some laughs at the expense of politicians for a moment. But let me actually just turn this back to you. And I want everyone in the audience here for a moment to think about your face, your particular face. And you understand that your face is a very important thing to you. In fact, it's kind of the, one of the keys to your identity. Now imagine for a moment that a cartoonist has, puts all of their focus on your face, takes, takes it apart, and reassembles it under their control. Then, by the way, that image is then put on the front of a newspaper for millions of people to ogle and giggle at your expense. That's what it feels like to be a politician having to deal with a six-year-old like me, okay? <laughs> Just now keep that, 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 op, that note in your mind for a moment. Now one of the things about being a caricaturist <laughs> is that our business is to, make, uh, to tell stories with faces, but when we become a political cartoonist, the caricature is just one part 
of the whole story we're trying to get across. And not only that, we not only do his caricature about exaggerating faces, it can also be about exaggerating other parts of the body. Now, for example, here's a cartoon that I did this week on Wednesday at the hotel across the street. I did this cartoon for The Economist. It's several parts. Now, you guys all know the story that, you know, we have Ukraine has got Russian troops in there, and NATO now is talking about putting heavy uh, weaponry in Poland. And then Putin responded this week by saying he wanted to add 40 new missiles to their nuclear arsenal. So here's a cartoon. So the first one, here he is, he's going, how about this? And what uh, NATO response is, is, oh, yeah? How about this? Putin, not to be outdone, says, oh, yeah? How about this? And then it carries on. How about this? How about this? And then the, the audience, which is basically all of us, and wh what is our response? I much prefer arms reduction talks. <laughs> OK? So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So caricature, great thing. It's a great part of our business. Now, one of the things about being a cartoonist, I told you when you do caricatures, how do you learn? You learn it by just by uh, you know, going out there and trying it. But being a political cartoonist is much harder. There's no schools for it. So you learn from those who came before. And so as a youngster growing up, particularly prior to the internet, it meant that I was always looking for books. And my life changed when I saw this book. This book done by Terry Mosher is a history of Canadian political cartoons. Now, you guys don't realize how lucky you are. Here in Canada, I believe you have the best per pound or per capita, whatever measurement, the best political cartooning in the world today. It's a really interesting combination of British humor or British bite and American humor, American yucks. Put those two things together and you got some great Canadians. And so when I was looking at this the, through these, I learned about the great uh, Duncan McPherson, the Toronto cartoonist, here with, with Clark and Trudeau. And he's saying, let's hear you say fiddle, fuddy duddle, I think he says. And then also from, from Roy Peterson, okay, with Chrétien right there, and Mo Rooney getting, getting a weird something. So you can see though, now, that I studied these guys and noticed the use of white space and the lovely line and the elegant lines of characters. So when I had this cartoon last year win Cartoon of the Year in Europe, it has a lot of influence from the Canadians. Here's, a, here's the Pope saying, we have gathered here today to extend a welcoming hand from the Vatican to gaze. And you can see all of their reticence in that regard. So what happens is the cartoons all learn from each other. It's an important part of our business is that we, 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 we pick from, from those who came before. Now, now we're on the, the, the subject of religion. I wanted to show you this cartoon partly just because it's one of my favorite cartoons. It takes place in heaven. You can see, hello, Lord Almighty's office. Michael the Archangel speaking. May I help you? Voice from offstage. Who is it? It's Pope John Paul II on the line. Again? He's worried about this movement to ordain women as priests. But I've already told him what I think. Tell him I'm busy. I'm sorry, she's busy right now. <laughs> okay? Thank you. I had to get that one in there. All right, so now this brings me to the second part of my conversation about the future, <laughs> the future of cartooning. So we all know that the internet has had a big impact on so many um, industries, whether it's printing, it's music, and of course newspapers. And as newspapers have, uh, have gotten into trouble, usually one of the first casualties is the political cartoonist. In the United States we found, for example, in the 1980s, we had somewhere around 200 cartoonists. Now that number of political cartoonists is down to maybe around 50. So um, it's a concern about what happens next. Well, I want to introduce you to this guy. His name is Matt Bores. He's a young cartoonist who couldn't find a job on a newspaper. Last year, he was hired by a website um, which called Medium that actually hired him as a full-time cartoonist to do work because his work is fantastic, but also gave him a budget to commission other cartoonists to do political cartoons on the web. So this is the first of a series. This is actually after Steve Jobs died. So this is the first panel. So as you can see, hey, it's Steve Jobs. Welcome to iCloud, buddy. Oh, 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 goes back, hold on. Um, mind if I check you in on my iPad? And he goes, cute, look, I'm a Buddhist, all right? All these cartoons are depicting me in heaven. Show me some respect and reincarnate me. Reincarnate me. He says, fine. And what does he do? <laughs> so, 
on a production line in China. So I think that, so, so it shows that he's got a sense of humor, and I think cartoons are going to be reincarnated on the internet. Now, the, now, there's another thing that everyone says, how do we get paid on the internet? Here's an interesting little piece I wanted to share with you. This is the uh, South Korean version of, of um, Google called Naver. And up, in, up, in the, up there, you can see a, a, a tab which actually um, shows a, a webtoons that are available um, to um, people who visit um, the website. Now, this is important because prior to this happening, cartooning in South Korea was in really bad straits. The cartoonists weren't getting any work. It's a similar sort of scene that we're seeing playing out in many of the Western countries. But what happened here was as soon as they offered this tab where cartoonist work were be was being put up here, and they would have a, uh, a kind of a schedule where on uh, different cartoonists would be scheduled on certain days. And soon they got so much popularity when hundreds of thousands of people were viewing them that the cartoonists were now getting webtoon apps. They had feature length movies, hit TV shows made off of their work. And they just expect, learned something that we all know. Cartoons are really popular. And so that it's, we think that if cartoonists are given an opportunity in the new web space, that we're going to succeed. Another thing that gets me excited goes back to caricature. This is a thing called Caricaturama 3000. It appears on Facebook. And one of the things, because it's hard to learn caricature today with the web, with all of this information out there, cartoonists are able to learn from each other. So we have a situation where once a week there's a, there's a cartoon contest where cartoonists around the world are given a person that they're to draw, everyone submits their work. There's often scores, if not hundreds, of cartoon entries to this. At the end of the week, Everybody votes, and the winner is declared, and the prize is you get to choose who to draw next week. If I had had this growing up, I would have grown a lot more faster as a cartoonist. But one of the key things is in developing nations that don't have a tradition of satire, don't have a tradition of cartooning, they're learning fast through these new tools. But I told you before there was no school in cartooning. Well, now there is. British cartoonist Paul Moyes, American cartoonist Jason Seeler are actually sharing their cartoons and giving classes on how to become caricatures on the web. Now, finally, I want to bring you to the world of animation, OK? Now, first, um, I have to say I've got a little bit of a pa uh, passion for animation because my senior thesis at university was a 13-minute-long uh, anima uh, yeah, animated cartoon back in the day. And I did this cartoon that won uh, uh, several awards in the UK back in 1986. It's a television commercial starring um, Margaret Thatcher and Neil Kinnock. And I hope Did you consider that some newspapers treat politics with a trace of bias? One side always right, the other side always wrong. Or the other way around. Today, we'll show all politicians without bias, not as saints or devils, but ordinary people. Hey, yeah! Order! Order! Today, colors the newspaper, not the news. Today, the newspaper that's broken the mold. What happens is that the animation is such a great way to get people's attention, but you saw that cartoon was about taking caricatures, these very powerful things, and making them come alive. But that cartoon took three months to make. Three months to make, because it was hand-drawn, 700 drawings. But today, with computer technology, it's amazing what you can do. And one of the, the, the world leaders in this is this cartoon here that many of you might be familiar with, La Flac, a uh, French-Canadian um, half-an-hour satire show done by Serge Chaplot, a cartoonist um, from Montreal. This cartoon is leading the world in the possibility of, of animation and satire. And it's, they're inspiring so many people. In fact, they inspired me. I did back in 1998 um, a cartoon featuring um, these guys, caricatures of these guys, which in, and I toured second, with Second City around the US using these cartoons. In fact, it, we ended up in New York City with a, a live debate between John McCain and, and here Barack Obama. And actually, I, I invited, if you guys don't mind, I invited uh, John McCain here tonight to answer a question. Um, Senator, uh, our Canadian neighbors here were very curious about Sarah Palin. Why, did you really think she was qualified to become president? Listen, my friends, Sarah Palin is qualified to be president.
She has ridden caribou to hunt polar bears with bazookas. She has caught Chinook salmon blindfolded with her teeth. No community organizer in Chicago has ever done that, right? That's right, that's great. Give it up for Senator McCain. Thank you very much, Senator, for coming here tonight. Thank you. All right, so anyways, let me bring this around to the future of cartoons. What does this all mean? Well, one of the things that I feel is, is really great for us is that there's more satire out there than ever before. Um, there's the lower barrier to entry. The internet has done this for many industries. It's also happening for cartoonists. That you have people who, who just have opinions, who want to create vines, or create videos, or create their own web comics, and they can put them on the web. But one of the important things about all of these cartoons are getting out there is that half the population of the world is under the age of 25. And you can know that a large percentage of those folks are also on the web. And every cartoon that is being created and every cartoon that's being put up there, whether it's by a print cartoonist like Terry myself or it's a web cartoonist like the ones we've seen here, these are all seeds of democracy. I have exhibitions that appear in, in um, nations around the world, and they often people will see my cartoons critical of Barack Obama and George Bush, and they laugh, and then they know, why aren't you in jail? Why are not your hands broken? And they are amazed at what we, uh, what we take for absolute granted here. Now, earlier I asked you to all to imagine for a moment that uh, your face was being drawn. Now, I want you also for a moment to now imagine that you are ahead of an authoritarian state, and you have your hands on the levers of government. You would try to do everything you can to make sure an ugly depiction of yourself does not appear in the press. Recently, a report done, put out by a uh, press foundation, uh, a press watchdog group in the US, cited that only in 14% of this world is there freedom of the press, okay? And it, what would likely happen is in most of the world, we couldn't even have this meeting. You guys would, uh, would be arrested, and I disappear not to be seen again. And our crime is making fun of our leaders. So we are so entirely lucky that we have this opportunity to stand here, be able to talk about this. We're so lucky that we're in that 14%. And I want to thank you guys for the time for being out here. All right, thank you. All right. Thanks, All right, thanks a lot, buddy. All right. Thank you a lot. Thanks, man. All right, buddy. All right. Thanks.